The following presentation is brought to you by Perusia Media. Please listen at the end for more information about the many fine products available from Perusia Media. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, it's a, a great privilege for me to join you at this maternal heart of Mary Parish. When I walked into this church for the first time this morning, I was really struck by how overwhelmingly uh, obvious is the orientation of this church to the east, um, especially because of this large choir area here. So that will actually, it, it will furnish a perfect illustration of many of the points I'm going to make this evening. Catholics who delve into serious discussions of liturgy, wishing perhaps to know what all the fuss is about, quickly discover that one of the hottest of hot button questions is the orientation of the liturgy. Monsignor Klaus Gamber once claimed that moving the priest to the back of the altar to face the people was the single most destructive change that occurred in the celebration of the Mass and he was not favorable to most of the other changes either. What is the big deal then about the direction the priest is facing at Mass? I would like to begin with two testimonials. Both are taken on purpose from Catholics who do not identify themselves as traditionalists. In fact, I have sparred with them on numerous occasions. To my mind, however, this gives their perspectives more weight inasmuch as they cannot be accused of simply wanting to turn the clock back. Their views are based on how things appear to them. The first is from a layman, David Clayton, the impresario of Pontifex Online University and the author of many books and articles on the way of beauty, who says the following about his experience of worship facing eastwards. Quote, this is perhaps the most striking and immediate way of symbolizing that we look to and recognize a higher power. My own conversion was influenced by seeing an ad orientem mass in which the priest was seen as the head of a body of people leading us towards a common destination. This impression just described was accentuated by the architecture and art of the church. It was the Brompton Oratory in London which served to focus my attention on and present to me visually images of what I otherwise would not have intuited." Unquote. A priest named Father Dwight Longenecker wrote on his personal blog some years ago about his experience of offering Mass ad orientem. Quote, I celebrate facing the same way as the people because I actually feel closer to them that way. I also feel closer to God. When I face the Lord with the people, I find that my own celebration of Mass is more intimate and mystical. I feel like I am able to focus more on the Lord and what is happening. If I need to weep, I can do so without people seeing me. If I need to pause and pray, I can do so without worrying what people are thinking." Unquote. He then comments on one particular experience that he believes was made possible for him in part by the fact that he was not, so to speak, on display, but focused on the prayer. Quote, as I celebrated mass, a strange awareness came over me. As I read the words from the Missal, it was as if the words themselves were alive and vivid. I cannot explain what I was seeing, except to say that the words were thronged with the meaning of the words. The words on the page were distinct, and that made every doctrine and truth distinct. It was as if each word and even each letter stood out with cosmic significance. Not that the words themselves were alive, but that the eternal meaning that the words communicated was alive and throbbing with meaning. Meaning that was alive as far, as far above me as the stars and as close to me as my own breath. Then I thought of the mysterious meaning of in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was as if this eternal mystery of the Incarnation was coming true again within the simple speaking of the words. Something happened 
a transaction was made between this world and eternity, unquote. Now, the way things appear to Mr. Clayton and Father Longenecker is, I would maintain, the way in which they would naturally appear to anyone who did not have bad habits or a predetermined judgment. Imagine, if you will, a person with no knowledge of the Catholic faith, or perhaps even of Christianity, walking one day into a great big church. As his eyes adjust, he sees a number of faithful dotted here and there in the pews, kneeling and looking ahead. At the far end of the church, in a more open area with more decoration than the rest of the building, he sees a group of men dressed in strange and elaborate garb, clustered round a large marble object with candles upon it. They are all facing the same direction as the faithful in the church. They are intently focused on what they are doing. For all the world, they look as if they're huddling around a sacrificial victim to kill it. It is clear that they are not focused on the people. Their business is not social, at least not in any obvious sense. After a few moments, our observer will have the impression that something very solemn and serious is happening, and that everyone in the building is, in their different ways, utterly intent upon this action, whatever it may be. If, in addition, he hears chant or polyphony, and smells incense, and feels the hard wood against his knees, worn smooth by so many worshipers, four out of five of his senses will be like the four evangelists, proclaiming a presence to him, even if he is not yet able to recognize it or call it by name. Our hypothetical visitor has already received his first and most important lesson in the Christian religion, that God is the first beginning and last end, the creator and sovereign Lord. He is seeing, in fact, played out before him the meaning of Psalm 144, verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. We have here a foundational experience of man turning himself towards the divine source of his being and destiny. Nothing, no amount of catechesis or homiletics or pastoral programs can ever substitute for this experience or even vie with it. Without this immediate and wordless awareness of God as the mysterium tremendum et fascinans, the fearful and fascinating mystery, for whose sake we stop paying attention for a moment to each other and to this world and stumble up to the edge of his domain so that his presence may infiltrate and permeate our domain. Without this, I say, there is no religion, no worship, no sacred liturgy. It may technically still happen, but the terrible words of the prophet Isaiah cited by our Lord would seem to fit the case. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines and commandments of men. The new forms of Catholic worship that came in after the Second Vatican Council so readily lend themselves to endless verbalization and explanation that they leave no place for Newman's cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And why? Because the minds of all are captured by a swirling anthropocentric vortex animated by the doctrines and commandments of men. That is, the false philosophical principles that guided the process by which we arrived at such novelties as versus populum, or the church reconfigured as a closed circle presided over by a clerical chairman. To avoid any risk of worshiping the Most Holy Trinity in vain, let us try to discover the deepest reasons for the ancient and, until recently, uninterrupted custom of praying eastwards, a custom that we truly find from the east to the west in every traditional rite of Christian worship, be it Byzantine or Latin, Slavic or Greek, Roman or Gallican or Ambrosian or Mozarabic, Chaldean, Coptic, Armenian or Ethiopian. For starters, the custom of all Christians either offering or participating in the Eucharistic liturgy facing east 
has the same apostolic roots and the same universality in church history as the use of water baptism, the praying of the Psalms, the worship of the risen Christ on Sunday, the honoring of the mother of God and the saints, and the veneration of relics. As a matter of fact, eastward orientation predates the use of official priestly vestments, consecrated church buildings, and the very Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed we recite every Sunday. Does that make it old enough and widespread enough to take seriously? If not, why do we take any of these other things seriously? They should be just as dispensable, if not more so. Think of it this way. Would you, if you are a practicing Catholic, want Sunday to be abolished, replaced by another day of the week, or simply taken off the roster? That would be an unthinkable deviation from Christian practice. Would you want all the Psalms removed from the Mass and the Divine Office? Should we replace water baptism with a civil naming ceremony, or stop honoring our Blessed Mother because it might make us feel like immature children, or offend anti-maternal feminists? Should we have priests celebrate Mass in blue jeans and t-shirts, because that's the common clothing of our day, as robes and cloaks were the common clothing of ancient times? Impossible. It cannot be that something we have done for millennia should suddenly be dropped. But this is exactly what has been done with Ad Orientem worship. For nearly 2,000 years, clergy and faithful together faced in the same direction, in expectation of Christ and in adoration of Him, the one who already comes in mystery in the Most Holy Eucharist, the one who is to come manifestly at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead and the world by fire. Ad Orientem preserves the eschatological orientation of the liturgy. When Christians first gathered on Sundays to worship the Lord, they were anticipating the second coming of Christ. This seems to be the very oldest characteristic of our corporate worship. As Dom Gregory Dix notes, the primordial form of Sunday was not so much a feast looking back to the resurrection of Christ on the first Easter or to any particular mystery or moment of his earthly life as it was a looking forward with longing to the Lord's return in glory, imploring him to deliver us from the evils of sin, death, and hell. Sunday Mass was primordially about the life of the world to come, which the early Christians, suffering bitter and horrific trials, must have thought about a great deal as they hoped and prayed that they would remain faithful. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For this reason, the eastward focus of prayer was a poignant symbol for the early Christians. After the dark and cold night, the sun will rise gloriously on the eastern horizon, shedding light and warmth. This mindset naturally found both inspiration and confirmation in the scripture passages that call Christ the Orient, or say that he ascends to the East or that he will come from the East. For example, Jesus says of himself in Matthew 24, 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the East and shineth even unto the West, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. This is the other reference I had in mind when I entitled my talk, From the East to the West. Psalm 6734 tells us, Sing ye to God who mounteth above the heaven of heavens to the east. The prophet Zechariah announces the Messiah in this way, Behold a man, the Orient is his name. The prophet Malachi calls Christ the Son of Justice. God is called light in 1 John 1.5. And his son is called the true light that enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world, as indeed the physical son does. Implicit in the description of King Solomon's dedication of the first temple is an ad orientem priestly gesture. As it says in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the sight of the assembly of Israel and spread forth his hands toward the heavens. This verse puts us in mind of the sursum corda, 
in the preface dialogue when the priest raises up his arms to God, gesturing that we should lift our hearts on high to him who lives and reigns forever enthroned above the cherubim. The Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom features a still more extroverted gesture as the priest repeatedly bows and lifts his hands aloft during the cherubicon or cherubic hymn. Verses and practices like these were, of course, repeatedly commented on by the Church Fathers, such as St. John Damascene, defender of icons, and St. Basil the Great, defender of the divinity of the third person of the Blessed Trinity. One of the most famous passages on our subject comes, in fact, in Basil's treatise entitled On the Holy Spirit, published in the year 375. The Cappadocian father writes, quote, Of the beliefs and practices, whether generally accepted or publicly enjoined, which are preserved in the Church, some we possess from written teaching, others we have received delivered unto us in a mystery by the tradition of the Apostles, and both of these, in relation to true religion, have the same force. And these no one will contradict, no one, at any any rate, who is even moderately versed in the institutions of the Church. For were we to attempt to reject such customs as having no written support on the ground that the importance they possess is small, we should unintentionally injure the gospel in its very vitals." Basil then offers a lengthy list of beliefs and practices not contained verbatim in scripture, but handed down by tradition. Quote, "'What writing has taught us to turn to the East at the Eucharistic prayer. Which of the saints has left us in writing the words of the invocation at the displaying of the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of blessing? For we are not, as is well known, content with what the apostle or the gospel has recorded, but both in preface and in conclusion we add other words as being of great importance to the validity of the ministry, and these we derive from unwritten teaching. We all look to the East at our prayers, but few of us know that we are seeking our own old country, paradise, which God planted in Eden in the East." So there you have Basil saying that praying towards the East, like most of what we do in the Eucharistic liturgy, is something handed down by unwritten tradition, not something that you find verbatim in Scripture. And that's a very important part of his apologetic Um, He's saying many of the most important things we do and believe are not written down in Scripture. Basil then argues that there is no more reason to worship eastwards than to worship the Spirit as God, since both are handed down by tradition. But since we all worship eastwards, therefore we should all adore the Holy Spirit. How is it possible for us to ignore the force of such a witness from the early church, who bases his argument for the divinity of the Spirit on the fact that we worship eastwards. That's an an amazing moment. I am reminded here of a similar argumentative move in the writings of St. Cyril of Alexandria, where he argues against Nestorius on behalf of the oneness of Christ, true God and true man, by saying, quote, We all know that the Holy Eucharist was given in order to divinize us, But if Christ is not truly the Son of God, receiving him in communion would never give us a share in his divinity, in the divinity. Hence, he must be the Son of God." Here, St. Cyril, who died in the year 444, takes for granted a universal belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and deduces the divinity of Christ from it. Such examples are extremely embarrassing for Protestants it must be admitted. But they are sadly no less embarrassing for post-conciliar Catholics who seem only too willing to turn their backs on such traditions, even when they can lay claim to apostolic origins. Thus, those who turned the priest towards the people severed themselves from that which was most ancient, most intrinsic, and most distinctive in their Christian worship. Whenever people return to ad orientum worship, they return decisively to the fundamentals of Christian faith and its original practice. Ironically, in adopting the novelty of versus populum, 
a supposed return to earliest practice in the judgment of mid-20th century scholars whose conclusions have been overturned by the work of subsequent scholars, we ended up losing one of the most ancient elements of all. It is not hard to see why this custom should have been nearly convertible with Christian worship. Most simply, worship is about God, not about us. Or rather, it is about us only insofar as we are from God, in God, and for God, our creator, savior, sanctifier, and judge. Hence, even to the extent that, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the liturgy is for our needs, since God, who is infinitely good, stands to gain nothing for himself. It is still done for the love and praise and thanking of God, who is the source and fulfillment of our needs. Our need, in short, is for God. Our deepest need is to go beyond ourselves into him. The very purpose of worship is to take ourselves out of ourselves and establish us in God. In this sense, any aspect of liturgy that does not clearly terminate in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or any aspect that seems to terminate in us, is not liturgy, whatever else it may be. Hence, the ad orientum stance simply expresses the act of worship as such, whereas the versus populum stance contradicts it. This is why it is not merely unfitting, but antithetical to the virtue of religion. I'll come back to that later. The theologian Max Turien, writing somewhat surprisingly in the official Vatican journal Notitiae, observed in a statement that anticipated Ratzinger's similar and more famous remark, quote, The whole celebration of Mass today is often conducted as if it were a conversation and dialogue in which there is no longer room for adoration, contemplation, and silence. The fact that the celebrants and faithful constantly face each other closes the liturgy in on itself." Along the same lines, the papal master of ceremonies, Guido Marini, remarked at a conference in Rome, quote, In our time, the expression celebration facing the people has entered our common vocabulary. Such an expression would be categorically unacceptable the moment it comes to express a theological proposition. Theologically speaking, the Holy Mass is always addressed to God through Christ our Lord. And it would be a grievous error to imagine that the principal orientation of the sacrificial action is the community. Such an orientation, therefore, of turning towards the Lord must animate the interior participation of each individual during the liturgy. It is likewise equally important that this orientation be quite visible in the liturgical signs as well." Marini helps us to see not only that the object of liturgy should always be God, or the God-man Jesus Christ, never mere man, but also that this objective orientation, we, we can't avoid the East even in our ordinary way of speaking, the orientation should be visible, evident to the senses, easily grasped by the intellect, and easily translated into the movement of the will that we call love, which is ordered to the good, to a good outside of ourselves. I will characterize the contrast between the contradictory postures in terms of their subject-object relationship. And again, it's important for me to emphasize this is not an interpretation of the motives of the clergy doing these things. I'm trying to give what you could call a phenomenological analysis, how things look, not what the intentions might be. The intentions might be very good, but it would still end up leading to to a false impression. In the odd orientum arrangement, the subject-object appears as man, God. The priest both looks and acts like an image of Christ, the mediator between God and man. Paradoxically, the ceremonial centrality of the priest in the old rite serves to emphasize that God is the one and only object of worship, since the priest is so obviously assimilated to his office as Alter Christus. In the versus populum arrangement, on the other hand, the subject-object appears as people-priest, 
The priest, even with the best of intentions and behavior, looks and acts like an empowered facilitator of a communal event. The vis-a-vis -vis positioning confers on him a sort of autocratic prominence as the one to whom the congregation is subordinated and beholden. This may be the psychological reason why some priests overcompensate with informality, jokes, banter, smiles, waves, applause, or what have you. The priest's very over-againstness seems to demand a downplaying of the over-against by means of emphasizing that he's really one of us after all. How sad that the one true and obvious way of representing that the priest is one of us, namely by having him face in the same direction as everyone else and offer the sacrifice on their behalf, the very same sacrifice they are offering in their hearts, has been discarded as an opaque and expired symbol to be replaced by a format that turns the mass into something done towards the people and, in a sense, imposed upon them. In reality, the mass is something Jesus Christ, according to his human nature, does towards the Most Holy Trinity, as the great prayer Sushipe Sancta Trinitas perfectly expresses, and we are permitted to join in. Ironically, for a rite that is supposed to be less clericocentric and more popular, the priest in the new rite becomes far more central and attention-getting because his personality, his vernacular style or way of being a priest, intrudes. Versus Populum does nothing but underline this unfortunate amplification of human presidency at the cost of assimilation to Christ's kenosis or self-emptying and his unique mediation. Kathleen Pluth, a liturgical musician, captures the problem and the solution. Having said that she hates being a cause of distraction to others by cantering in front of a church, and that she much, refers, prefer, sorry, she much prefers finding refuge in a choir loft, singers should be heard and not seen. By the way, I don't, I don't mind when the choir is used. That, that, that is why this was built. But in a lot of churches, the choir loft works very well. Um, she then turns to the celebrant of the Mass. Now, this is a lengthy quotation, but I really think it's worthwhile from Kathleen Pluth. Quote, The role of the priest is exponentially more complex than that of any musician. He cannot hide. His role is inherently and in some regards primarily visible leading the congregation through the veil into the Holy of Holies. We follow him as he expresses in the highest possible way his conformity to Jesus, our advocate before the Father. For centuries, the symbolism of our following the priest was clear. However, in the post-conciliar period and without a direct referent in the council's documents, the character of the priest's relationship to the people was distorted by the versus populum posture. When people face each other, they aim to please. They make eye contact. They smile encouragingly. There is a word for such gestures, flattery. People flatter their priests and their priests flatter them at an average ratio of, say, 500 to 1. None of this is encouraged in the council documents. The versus populum posture is specifically worldly. It sets up the priest not as a model to follow, but as a talk show host to be flattered insofar as he delights us. There are no good reasons for this. And this is still Kathleen Pluth. The lines of sight to God should be made clear in the liturgy, but instead our path towards God is obscured by the distracting cycle of eye contact and feedback. The Sunday liturgy is for everyone, their primary and for many, their only contact with the church. As such, its symbols should express the truth, including the truth about ecclesial relationships, which should not be a matter of flattery, but of service. The psalmist sings, let your priests be clothed with holiness, the faithful shall ring out their joy. The ad orientem posture lets priests be priests and the people be themselves all facing God together." Unquote. <laughs>
Accordingly, it was much to the devil's advantage to turn the priest around to the people, creating a charmed circle of neighborly affirmation that brought the experience of the Mass down to the level of a horizontal exchange, back and forth in everyday speech. There is nothing transcendent about that. On the contrary, God is domesticated, tamed, manipulable, not a recipient of sacrifice, but a subject of conversation. Ad orientem, the use of Latin and plain chant, and healing for communion are simple but potent ways to remind ourselves that we and God are not on the same playing field, that he is truly almighty, pantocrator, and we are his cre creatures and his subjects. These practices effectively repudiate the aberration of democratic horizontalism that has afflicted not only our entire social life as citizens, but also for the past 50 years, the church's social life as well, that is, her liturgy. The dismantling of these things, the removal of communion rails, practice of communion standing, reception of communion in the hand, the abolition of the acolyte with the paten, and so forth, all of these are consistent with a larger perspective of the warping of the act of worship into an act of precipitous self-esteem. For these reasons, I certainly concur with Martin Mosebach's assessment when he writes in his recently published book, Subversive Catholicism. That's a book that just came out a few days ago, incidentally. Quote, the missal of Paul VI did not prescribe the turning around of the altars. That is the most palpably felt transgression against the tradition of prayer in the whole world. The priest should turn himself along with the congregation to the crucified and to the Christ who will return from the East. He should direct his prayers in common with the congregation to the altar and to Christ. This change in the direction of prayer has caused greater harm in Europe and America, and perhaps Australia as well, than all of the relativizing, demythologizing, and humanizing theologies put together. It became patently clear to even the simple faithful that the prayers were directed not to God, but rather to the congregation, which was to be put in the correct mood so as to celebrate itself as the people of God." Unquote. Yes, the Mass was given to us by our Lord at the Last Supper for our benefit, since God does not benefit from our actions. But it benefits us precisely by ordering us to God first, giving him the primacy that is his by nature and by conquest. We are benefited by being subordinated to God, yielding ourselves to him as a rational sacrifice. We profit from being decentered on ourselves and re-centered on him, our first beginning and last end. We stand to gain the most when we most lose ourselves in him. It is exactly for these reasons that celebration of the Mass versus populum is not merely an unfortunate aberration based on poor scholarship and democratic socialist habits of thought endemic to modern Westerners. It is a contradiction of the essence of the Mass and a distortion of the proper relationship of man to God. Because of its inversion of the proper directionality of the worshiping community, people and priest alike, to the uncreated font and origin, it functions as a sort of immunization against the rational self-sacrifice that turns our souls and our bodies towards the Father in union with his beloved Son, whose meat is to do the Father's will, not his own, as a man. But wait a minute, an objector says. Let's say for the sake of argument that eastward orientation is better that it is more traditional and more meaningful. But isn't it also true that the Mass is a meal and that emphasizing this side of the reality isn't false and can even be a good idea sometimes, lest people forget it? Might it not have been useful after so many centuries of a mysterious and clericocentric form of worship to flip things around in order to make manifest the other side of the truth? This objection is well-intentioned. My answer to it is this. When we privilege a partial secondary truth over the more fundamental truth, we inculcate untruth. 
We can see this if we look at the history of Christian heresy. When the Arians privileged the truth that the Son is in some sense less than the Father, but neglected the more fundamental truth that he is God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the Arians inculcated an untruth, for the Son is not less than the Father, simply speaking, but only in a certain sense. When the Protestants privileged the truth that Jesus Christ is our Savior, but neglected the truth that he saves us in and through a visible body, the Church, of which we must become members in order to benefit from his saving action, they inculcated an untruth. A subjective conviction that I am saved has nothing to do with what we see happening in the New Testament, let alone the, the, the history of the early church. And then let me just take a more contemporary example. When modern day European liberal, liberals privilege the truth that man has innate dignity, but neglect the truth that his dignity is not absolute or independent of his social nature with its ensuing obligations towards society, they inculcate an untruth, for neither death nor the punitive sovereignty of civil authority is contrary to human dignity, simply speaking. All of these examples, and they could easily be multiplied, we see how the emphasis of a partial truth taken out of the context of the network of truths that give it meaning results in the establishment of a false system of belief, an ism that separates itself from Catholicism. I maintain that the same is true of versus populum. When liturgical reformers privileged the idea of a communal gathering for table fellowship, but neglected the more fundamental truth, recognized as de fide dogma by the Council of Trent, that the Mass is the unbloody representation of the bloody sacrifice of the cross, they inculcated an untruth. For the Mass is not first and foremost a group doing something together, but Jesus Christ offering himself in sacrifice and granting us the opportunity to unite ourselves to this perfect, all-sufficient offering in which our very salvation consists. It is the man who has, over his lifetime, become one with Jesus on the cross who will be saved. The emphasis of a partial truth that the Mass is a social or communal event involving edible refreshment, when taken out of the context of the larger dogma that gives this event its meaning and power, falsifies the partial truth and in fact makes it to be harmful, in the same way as Arianism, Pelagianism, and Protestantism are harmful, although each is built upon a truth. Celebration of the Liturgy of the Eucharist facing the people necessarily decontextualizes and falsifies the social nature of the Mass, and unavoidably, even if in many instances contrary to the devout wishes of its celebrant, suppresses its theocentric essence. For this reason, it inculcates a false understanding of the Mass, effectively decatechizing the faithful as to its true nature. It does not simply tilt the emphasis to one side or the other, it cancels out the orientation that is demanded by the very meaning of sacrifice, which is to be offered to God alone. That is to say, the Mass should absolutely avoid any appearance of being directed to the people, any appearance. He alone, moreover, he alone, God alone, deserves and demands our adoration. And if it is not clear that we are united together in adoration of the one who alone is worthy of adoration, then the unique right to God of such worship has been compromised or canceled out. If we recall that religion, this word religio in Latin, names for St. Thomas Aquinas a moral virtue by which we offer to God what is owed to him by means of external signs and rites, it would be accurate to say, though perhaps somewhat provocative, that ad orientem worship and versus populum worship are the expression of different religions, at least in the sense that something different is being displayed and given by the human actors. The problem then is not merely that the practice of celebrating mass towards the people has no foundation whatsoever in the history of Catholic or Orthodox worship. No, it is much worse than an unfortunate sociological aberration like the current fashion of body piercing the use of versus populum erodes and corrupts the faith of the people as to the essence of the Mass and the adoration of God, propter maniam gloriam eius.
the absolute primacy of God over man and the corresponding duty of man to subordinate himself to God, as opposed to the ancient sophists and enlightened moderns who unite in the error that man is the measure of all things. I once received an eloquent letter from a priest who argued strenuously against the position that I have been, have been defending thus far. He said, and I include only these salient points, quote, may I ask a simple question? Where is God up there, out there, or with us, among us? I imagine everyone would say he is both, he is everywhere, but clearly no arrangement of physical space in our churches or other buildings can adequately convey both his imminence and his transcendence. By the way, this is a long quote, so I'll tell you when it's done. Seeing, however, that after centuries of odd orientum worship, emphasizing the apartness, remoteness, and unapproachable glory of God, the Christian churches seem to be in continual decline, Many would contend that it is high time to redress this distorted balance and emphasize the presentness of God with us. This is what the Reformed liturgy seeks to do. It is, of course, a senseless caricature to see it as priest and people greeting or confronting each other in an anthropocentric way. Rather, it is priest and people gathering together around the altar, which is the focus of our worship, knowing that God in Christ is present in our midst. If we can rediscover God among us, we might be able to realize more appropriately his glorious apartness as well. It is not a matter of contradictory theologies, but of complementary ones. And this, this priest continues, so far as I can see, we do not relate to God solely as an object of worship out there or up there, but also as a reality, a real presence in us and with us. Our symbolism cannot adequately convey all of this, so we make our choice of what we want to emphasize. Traditional worship has emphasized the glorious otherness of God. Many now think we need to redress the balance towards his presence with us. The book of Acts records the first followers of Christ breaking bread in their homes. It is surely highly unlikely that they would have set up anything like the medieval church with nave and sanctuary, and far more likely that they would have gathered at or around a simple table. If anything, the earliest Eucharist was probably more like our Reformed liturgy today than the grandiose ad orientem high mass." Unquote. To his credit, this priest quite capably presents some of the main arguments used by critics of ad orientem and or advocates of versus populum. Here is how I responded. Dear Reverend Father, I think this is the wrong way to go about the question. God is indeed everywhere. That doesn't help at all with determining how liturgy should be done. Starting from the simple fact of his omnipresence, we might end up with the attitude of religion-free hippies. I worship God on the beach or in the mountains. And while it is never wrong to lift one's personal praises to God in the great outdoors, this is not the path any Orthodox Christianity ever took for its weekly or daily memorial of the saving death of Jesus. The question should rather be put this way. What symbols do we use in Christian worship to express our relationship to God and his to us? And to answer that question, we have to look to the three principles of cosmos, history, and mystery, as Ratzinger argues in The Spirit of the Liturgy. The universe, the cosmos, which is God's first book, gives us the rising sun from the east. That is why God's second book, that is sacred scripture, talks so much about the Orient. The sun, the moon, and the stars were given to men for signs and seasons, as we read in the book of Genesis. If they are signs, what are they signs of? We ignore nature at our peril, now more than ever, when artifacts and technology insulate or even alienate us from reality. That the sun rises in the east signifies that Christ is the true light who enlightens every man. Church history, for its part, gives witness of oriented churches where the nave gives way to the sanctuary, which gives way to the altar. How likely is it that the custom of facing east to worship 
which suddenly came into public view in basilicas across the entire civilized world as soon as Christianity was legalized in the early fourth century, how likely was it that this was something made up on the spot? The ancient Christians were far too jealous of their customs. It is far more likely that their preferred manner of praying was rooted in the habits of prayer handed down from the apostles themselves, as we saw, as St. Basil the Great testified. To remain symbolically effective, eastward prayer does not need to be set within elaborate architecture or ritual, although clearly all the later architecture and ceremonial is like the pearl that forms around this initial grain of sand. The third criterion, mystery, tells us that we should not worship in such a way that we risk deifying ourselves or our community. Our worship has to be outward and upward in order to reinforce in us through sensible signs that we will not save ourselves but must seek salvation beyond ourselves. True though it is that the soul is the temple of the Blessed Trinity, it can be dangerous to shape public worship in terms of God's immanence within us since fallen human beings tend to be self-absorbed and self-exalting. Traditional forms of worship greatly accentuate both God's transcendence and his immanence. His transcendence in the various ways already mentioned. His immanence by the fact that our worship is physical, sensuous, concerns food and drink and other ordinary things through which the infinite and eternal God meets us in a definite place and time. I have never found that a Latin low mass or high mass interferes with my awareness that God is within. On the contrary, the long opportunities for prayer, the intensive preparation for Holy Communion, and the time spent in thanksgiving for the gift of our Lord are ways in which my interior life has been greatly augmented, and especially my wonder at the astonishing humility of God who comes to dwell within us. While it is true that a decline in numbers of Christian worshipers began in some places already in the middle of the 20th century, it is a fact that the Catholic Church was booming throughout most of the world, with vocations, conversions, baptisms, and other statistics riding high. What happened? The increasing humanism of the 20th century came to a head in the antinomianism, the, the anti-law mentality of the 1960s, when progressivism, liberalism, and hedonism introduced profound unrest, malaise, and dissatisfaction with inherited forms of life and piety. But this was not the fault of the forms. It was the fault of those who rejected them in favor of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Or more innocently, but no less fatally, felt banners, casual presidership, and folksy kindergarten church songs. If some reform was needed, what we got was certainly not it. May Christ, our true light, the Orient and the Son of Justice, who dawned on the world in his incarnation and will return from the East as our judge, grant each and all of us the grace to do our part in restoring this ancient tradition. Ut in omnibus glorificetur Deus, that God may be glorified in all things. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation brought to you by Perusia Media. Perusia Media is an Australian-based media company bringing you good, wholesome Catholic formation material in DVD, CD, and book formats. Visit our website at www.perusiamedia.com. That's www.parousiamedia.com. Thank you for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family.